welcome to the last day uh, of what has been a very intense several days here at the Milken Institute Global Conference. Uh, this is the Hail to the Chief panel, and <laughs> we're very fortunate this morning to have uh, a couple of really Washington insiders who understand the office of the presidency. Uh, Ambassador Stu Eisenstadt, an individual that I've been fortunate enough to call friend for, I think, about 30 years now, mm -hmm. uh, has been a Washington insider for over 40 years. He's had the opportunity to understand the subject matter of our panel today from the inside. He was involved as a very, very young man in President Lyndon Johnson's um, during his presidency. He was a key member, domestic policy advisor, uh, and very close confidant to this day of President Jimmy Carter. He held several positions in Bill Clinton's administration, uh, both in the State Department, Commerce, Secretary, uh, Treasury, and was the ambassador to the EU, uh, and also did some consulting to the Secretary of State in President Barack Obama's administration. Mm -hmm. He recently wrote a very detailed book mm -hmm. about his time with President Carter, uh, we may touch on that a little bit today, though that's not the subject, but he'll be doing a book signing right after this session. Uh, and we are really very happy today to have with us Stuart McLaren, because it's the last day of the conference. They would only let me have panelists with the same name, <laughs> knowing that that's the only way I would not make a mistake. Uh, Stuart today is the president of the White House Historical Association. He's been in Washington for many decades, more than he probably wants to think about, uh, including spending time in the Energy Department as part of the Reagan administration. Uh, for over 25 years, he's held senior positions at George Washington Mount Vernon Estate, the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation, uh, the Motion Picture Association, Georgetown University, I think you were Chief of Staff for Elizabeth Dole at American Red Cross, uh, as well as his work in the federal government and today, as I said, as President of the White House Historical Association. Stewart's had a time to, review, to view the presidency up close, but from a very different lens than Ambassador Eisenstadt. So for ease of reference this morning, I'm going to refer to Ambassador Eisenstadt as Stu, and to Stewart as Stewart. So I will try to remember that if you guys can try to remember I think we can that. that. Okay. Yeah. Our goal this morning, to make it really clear why we're here, is to understand the complexities and the limitation of the office of the president. The Constitution gives the president very limited powers. It does not really enumerate very much of what those powers are. A lot of those powers have basically evolved over time. We're not here to critique any particular president. We're not here to get involved in what society spends too much time on today, which is divisive and partisan politics. Uh, we're not trying to distort what is. We're trying to understand the complexities of this very, very important office and have a very informative discussion. We will look at how politics affects the presidency, the dynamic between the White House and the Congress, the relationship between the president and the press and how that has evolved over time. And we will look at even how investigations of the presidency have affected the public's perception of the presidency and the office. So again, I will repeat that we're not here to condemn or to really uh, compliment any particular president. We're here to keep a nonpartisan discussion about a very, very important topic today. So with that, I'm going to begin by asking the two of you, which president do you believe? And we'll start with the Kennedy going forward, since Kennedy was probably the first television president, where television really affected the presidency as we've moved on. Um, which president do you feel was the most powerful president and the least powerful president? So, Stuart, I'll start with you. Starting with Kennedy. We can't go back beyond Kennedy. That's right. Those are the rules. Okay, the rules. <laughs> I don't play by the rules very well. But, uh, well, I think uh, you can't discount Kennedy himself because when he's coming into the television era, he understood that medium much as others would deploy Twitter uh, and other uh, outlets today. The television was uh, his art form, and he mastered that. He was also, comparatively, you had the young Jack Kennedy and the young 32-year-old uh, Jacqueline Kennedy, 
that visually compared to Eisenhower, Dwight Eisenhower and Mamie. So you had a real generational shift. So I think he rose what is power, I guess I would say, if you want to define what does power mean in the most powerful. But he rode that wave into his presidency in popularity, and uh, he surely faced his challenges. And I think he thought he could do without Eisenhower, but he actually summoned him to Camp David on one occasion to seek his counsel. So I think I would go with the first in the modern as as really being a, a, an influential because of the medium that he took advantage of as president. And the least powerful? And well, you can define power any way you want. Yeah, well, you know, I, I think they're, these are different creatures. You know, the only thing that these 45 guys have in common is the time that they spent in that little White House we call the White House, except for George Washington who built it but never lived there. And so strength and weakness is, I think, it's really hard to measure and it's really hard to define. And I think what may have been the case at the time of their presidency, as seen through the rearview mirror of now, like when he left office, so this is just before our start line of, of Kennedy, but when he left Eisen, office, Eisenhower was viewed as one of the worst presidents in American history. And now he's rated, uh, any survey would show he's one of the top five. And so we, continually to, we continue to review and look at these presidencies, as this book does uh, really well. And I should say in beginning, it's such an honor to be on a panel with such the great statement, statesman, uh, Ambassador Eisenstadt, and all that he's accomplished in his career. And this great book uh, very elegantly uh, depicts a, a presidency that had its challenges and its public perceptions at the time. But you look at how Jimmy Carter has evolved in the public mind today, and the great work he's done post-presidency is really significant. So I think it's hard to say you know, are you looking at just the years there in office? Are you looking at the impact on the whole of their presidency and what their legacy uh, continues to have a role in the world today? That's really hard to say. I think they all have their strengths, they all have their weaknesses, and they're all human. Okay. Stu? So, Richard, let me define what I conceive of power of a president. As you mentioned, the Constitution gives the president very few real powers besides being commander-in-chief. His real power is being politician-in-chief. Mm -hmm. The capacity as the only elected official nationwide to be able to speak to the American people, to mobilize their support, to get interest groups, to back his policies, to put pressure on Congress both with favors but also mobilizing public pressure in support of it. So the best presidents have been the best politicians. And let me then talk about several that I've worked with directly. So President Johnson was someone who exuded power. Mm. He was six foot four, 240 pounds. When he came into an office, you felt the Lord himself had come in, a powerful figure, powerful mm -hmm. voice, the so LBJ treatment. And he used that power after the Kennedy assassination and his overwhelming victory in 64 to transform our social landscape, Medicare, Medicaid, mm -hmm. Head Start, all the great society programs. And then he dissipated that power. He lost it because of Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And in the end, and I was there when that happened, he decided to pull out of the 68 campaign. I ended up working for Humphrey as a result. So second is Jimmy Carter. Carter is viewed as a weak president. I make the case here that he actually is a very strong president, but had a very odd view of politics. His strength was his weakness. He was a ferocious campaigner, but he believed that once you got into the White House, you parked politics at the Oval Office door and did the quote-unquote right thing. That enabled him to take on issues like Panama, the Middle East peace process, energy, things that were highly unpopular and that other presidents had shied away from. But it was also a weakness because he didn't recognize that beside being commander-in-chief, a president has to be politician-in-chief. Mm -hmm. He has to mobilize his base, something the current president does very well. He has to keep his party together. He ended up having a party split when Ted Kennedy ran against him. And by not nurturing his political base, it actually was a weakness. Mm. Third president was Bill Clinton. So Clinton had it all. Rhodes Scholar, absolutely brilliant. And whereas President Carter 
tended to look at issues on a sallow basis. Bill Clinton connected all the dots. He loved politics. He loved politicians. He was a great speaker. He was able to mobilize the power of the public. But he also dissipated his power with the Monica Lewinsky affair. I mean, one of the great tragedies is wasting two of his last years in office by fighting that effort. So you can have power, you can use it, but it has to be nurtured every day of the week, and it can be so easily dissipated by taking the wrong turn as LBJ did. So I would make one last case, if I may. Ronald Reagan defeated us soundly in 1980. We won six states in the District of Columbia. And I would make the argument that Reagan is one of the most powerful presidents. He transformed the Republican Party in, from a sort of staid fiscal belt tightening to a go-go party of tax cuts and supply-side economics. He was an internationalist. Mm -hmm. He mobilized political force. He was a great speaker. Uh, I know that from having prepared President Carter for the debates against him. Uh, and he had his flaws, Iran-Contra and so forth, but he was able to keep his political power roughly in check for eight years and become a very popular president to this day. So I would have to rank him quite high on the okay. list of presidents, even though I didn't work for him. I saw him on the other side. So, Well, it's interesting, Stuart, you made a comment earlier about how Kennedy didn't think he needed Eisenhower, but then summoned him to Camp David. Mm -hmm. um, we know that this is an extremely complex position, uh, a position that the whole world's looking at you every single day. Um, do you know any other, uh, do either one of you know any other instances where the president has sought advice from one yes. or more of the presidents? Yeah. Yes, so uh, first of all, President Carter would talk to President Ford, but also when he was very low in the polls, and he came back from the Tokyo G7 summit, he canceled the energy speech I had coordinated, and he took advice from the so-called best and brightest at Camp David to try to write his presidency. That's what led to the crisis of confidence speech, so-called Malay speech. Uh, one of the most interesting pieces of advice he got about how to write his presidency was from a young 32-year-old first-term governor from the South who said, Mr. President, your problem is you're always talking sacrifice you know, lower the temperature, tighten your belt, fiscal uh, responsibility. You should love politics and love people. That was Bill Clinton. <laughs> uh, that led to his uh, speech, the Crisis of the Commons speech, which was actually a great speech. It, uh, he went up 17% in one day, but then by firing the cabinet, it dissipated it. But I want to use one other example of presidential power, which is unparalleled, and that is Jimmy Carter at Camp David. 13 days and nights with three and four hours of sleep, he brings Menachem Begin and Anwar Sadat together from Israel and Egypt. They were like two scorpions in a bottle when we put them together the first of 13 days. So Carter drafted himself 22 separate peace agreements and then negotiated between the two of them and realized that power can also come indirectly. So he took them, Stuart and Richard, to Camp David in his limo the first Sunday of the 13 days, he took him from there to the Gettysburg battlefield mm -hmm. to dramatize what five wars between Egypt and Israel meant. Mm -hmm. Sadat was a general. He knew all the foibles that the South made Pickett's last charge a little uncomfortable for Carter as a southerner. Begin was a historian and knew Lincoln and on the spot gives the Gettysburg address. Mm -hmm. It was dramatic, but we get to the last of the 13 days He's exercised every bit of presidential power that he could. And Begin said, Mr. President, I can't make any more compromises. I'm going home. And Carter realized that would blow up the whole Middle East. Sadat could be assassinated. It would engulf his own presidency. And he knew that Begin had a great love for his eight grandchildren. So he has eight copies of uh, the photograph of the three of them coming in, autographs it to each of Begin's grandchildren, goes over and hands it to him, sees Begin sub-vocalize each of their names. His eyes tear up. He drops the bag and said, I'll make one last try. Now, I think it was the greatest act of presidential personal diplomacy in American history, more than Woodrow Wilson after the Paris Peace Agreement. That was the use 
of presidential authority and power in the most constructive way. Well, in just picking up on this theme of transition, okay, so, you know, one of the things that's really amazing about the way that we treat our presidents and we move from one to another is right. the transition. Right. Talk a little bit about what happens as one president leaves and another one comes in. Well, there's the election in November, as you know, and then the, each team has uh, set up a pre-transition organization that is thinking about appointments and hirings. Uh, then uh, the House piece of it, you have to think about where you're going to live. So traditionally, the incoming First Lady will go and visit with the outgoing First Lady to see what this place looks like that they're going to live. Michelle Obama tells a wonderful story that she was so afraid of what it was going to be like raising two young girls in a museum. Like, what would that be like? And the elevator, she goes up the elevator with Mrs. Bush and the doors open and she realizes, well, this is a home. We can live here. We can raise a family here. But nothing really actually exchanges until that inauguration day on the 20th of January, which you're very familiar with that scene, the new president and first lady leave Blair House, go over to the north portico of the White House. The outgoing president first lady come out, greet them, and they go inside. And I'd love to be a fly on the wall for that conversation. <laughs> that would just be a really great time. Uh, then the presidents uh, then go up to the Capitol, Capitol Hill, and the first ladies follow. And immediately after they walk out that north door, the White House goes into essentially a four-hour transformation. Everything that belonged to one goes out. Everything uh, that it belongs to the other comes in. The clothes are brought across the street from Blair House. If the First Lady left makeup out on the counter that morning, it's put out on the counter in the White House. When she comes back uh, from the parade and gets ready for the inaugural balls, there her things are. There's pictures of them from earlier in the day, which is would be common today, but 20 years ago, that was a marvel. To, to Barbara Bush talks about, I came back from the inauguration and there were pictures of us in the White House. I couldn't believe it. And so life begins immediately. And if you are in an administration, your pass is deactivated at 12 noon. And if you're in, the, you tell a wonderful story at the end of your book about that. And uh, if you're an outgoing member of the administration, you're walked out of the White House, your badge is deactivated because the new guys are coming in. There's no time to acclimate to the new. The new staff comes in and they immediately start working while the president who's just taken the oath of office is still up on Capitol Hill having lunch and then walking back or riding back in the parade. But it's the transformation of the Oval Office and the residents upstairs that happens in a four hour time slot and the professional staff, the, res the uh, career staff of the White House largely makes that happen and they are the best of the best at what they do in taking care of the president and the first family. But it's a marvel uh, to watch this it, it transformation in such a short period of time. So Richard, I've been involved personally in two, coming in and going out. It's a lot more fun coming in than going <laughs> out. Uh, we're unique. In a parliamentary system, there's an immediate transformation of power. The day after the election, you have shadow cabinet mm -hmm. people who are in the opposition. They immediately become the cabinet. We have a two and a half month period. Now, let me give you some anecdotes of the one going in. We beat Ford, and we I'm the only staff person that Carter asked to be with him when he gets his CIA briefings. The CIA briefing was given by a young man who was a CIA director named George H.W. Bush. <laughs> and it was that briefing which convinced Carter that we had a major energy crisis. We had a disastrous transition coming in. There was infighting between the staff. The president made a terrible mistake in deciding not to have a chief of staff, to be his own chief of staff. He misread the Watergate lesson of H.R. Haldeman and Nixon. It wasn't that there was a chief of staff. It was he had a crook as chief of staff. Mm -hmm. And he decided by being his own chief of staff, we had no one setting priorities. It was a real mistake. Mm -hmm. Now, going out, a couple of specific anecdotes. First, we lose the election overwhelmingly, as I mentioned. And Carter says to us the morning after, get your chins off the ground. We're going to make this the best transition out ever. Mm -hmm. What did we do? We passed, as a lame duck president, the Superfund bill to clean up chemical waste. We negotiated the hostage Iranian rescue effort. Okay? We did the Alaska lands bill, which doubled the size of the national park system over the fierce opposition of the Alaska delegation. 
And here's an anecdote you'd never see today. I get a call from Ted Kennedy, December of 80, and he said, Stu, there's a vacancy on the First Circuit Court of Appeals. I'd like the president to appoint <laughs> Stephen Breyer, who was a Harvard Law School professor, and you worked with him on my staff for airline deregulation. And I said, Ted, there are two insurmountable hurdles. The first is the president has no love lost for you. You ran against him, split the party, and never reconciled. He said, I know, that's why I'm asking you and not the president. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, what's the other problem? He said, the other problem is that we lost the Senate. <laughs> Strom Thurmond's going to be the new chairman. He can just wait, think of Merrick Garland now, he can just wait two and a half months, let Reagan appoint a conservative. He said, you take care of Carter, I'll take care of Kennedy. So I go in to see the president. I said, don't ask me who's asked for this, but there's a vacancy on the First Circuit. You know how brilliant Steve is, how important he was to airline deregulation. He understood. He said, okay, I'll do it. So I called Ted. I've done my part. How about yours? Strom's in the bag. I said, what do you mean he's in the bag? He's a conservative Republican. You're a liberal. Dumb. He said, Stephen has breakfast every morning with his chief of staff, Emory Sneed, and they work a lot of things out on a bipartisan way. And Stephen is nominated and confirmed by the Senate unanimously, wow. every Republican. Would you see that today? Yeah. One last thing, and goes to Stewart's point about the pictures going down. So we were desperate to get the hostages released before Carter leaves office. The agreement to do so was negotiated before, but Khomeini wanted to rub it in. And so when does he release the hostages? One minute after Reagan takes the oath of office. So Ham Jordan, who became chief of staff in the last part of the administration, is staying in the office in the White House with a contact with one of our staff people on the podium hoping that the release will come before the swearing in. It doesn't. The Secret Service then says, Mr. Jordan, I'm sorry, you have got to get out of here. And every photograph we had in one minute becomes replaced with the one of Reagan. So then we get on the traditional Air Force One trip back to Plains, and Ham calls the White House and says, can you please tell me what happened on the hostage release? And they said, we're sorry, Mr. Jordan, you've lost your clearance. We can't tell you. No. It's definitely a new administration <laughs> and a new day. That's right. So just uh, pick up a little bit about what you talked about with Camp David. Um, there's been a number of negotiations that every president has had, uh, the ones that I remember the most uh, in my lifetime, obviously with Kissinger, um, all the way through negotiations that are going on at this minute in China on trade. You know, what are the elements that, you know, go into a successful versus unsuccessful negotiation? So ironically, just literally yesterday, I interviewed Henry Kissinger for a book I'm doing on successful negotiations, and I've focused on his China negotiations. Mm -hmm. So he was saying the following, and it certainly applies to Carter at Camp David. Number one, the president has to understand the history and the issues. He had to understand the way in which China looked at negotiations. You don't negotiate directly with them. You no negotiate indirectly. You have to understand the personalities. In his case, Cho and Lai. In Carter's case, Sadat and Begin. He had to understand that Sadat said to him, Mr. President, I will give you full authority. Whatever you agree to, I will agree to on behalf of the Arab Republic of Egypt as long as I get all the Sinai back and some fig leaf for the Palestinians. Don't worry about details. Begin, on the other hand, had, was a lawyer and he was involved in every detail. We had to go around him to Azar Weitzman and Moshe Dayan and to uh, Aharon Barak, his legal counsel, to get it done. So it requires knowledge of the issues, knowledge of the personalities. It requires determination. It requires stick to itiveness. If you can't find one way, you go another, which is what Carter did at the end with, with Begin. Uh, those are the elements. You cannot have a successful summit like the one in North Korea as a photo opportunity. That's not a successful summit. You have to really get your fingernails involved in, in the issues and understand them and understand the personalities. And one last thing, and, and Kissinger made this point to me yesterday, and, and I, it's been a lotus star for me in all the negotiations I've done in the 
in the uh, Clinton administration where I negotiated all the sanctions issues. You have to understand what the bottom line is for your administration and you have to have the support of the president for that. But you also have to know what the bottom line is for the other country. There's no point in pushing them beyond what they can't go to. Mm. And finding that compromise is what it's all about. And then sometimes, and this is the last point, because Kissinger also made me a fan, it's using creative language that sometimes has ambiguities in it. One example of that is what LBJ did with UN Resolution 242 after the 67 war, which was Israel was to withdraw from territories occupied in the war, not all territories. So the Arabs interpreted it as all territories, the Israelis as some territories. So sometimes you have to paper over differences with ambiguities. It can get you into trouble, but at least it gets you in agreement. Mm. Yeah, please. Uh, for negotiations, I think um, you, you look at the modern presidency and all of the departments of government and the experienced diplomats that we have and the deployment through at embassies all across the world. But historically speaking, you look back to an earlier time, and I think it's amazing if, if these things had been accomplished now, we would be stunned by them. Uh, look at Jefferson, uh, his minister to France. He was before or after Kennedy, I just want to. I think he was uh, before, clear. a okay. couple of years before. Okay, go. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm the history guy. Go, I'm, I'm sorry. Stuart, please. So, so, um, <laughs> look at Jefferson, his uh, minister to France, ambassador at that time is James Monroe, and he's able to get um, all the Louisiana Purchase, negotiate with France, the Louisiana Purchase, that almost double the size of the country in one fail swoop. And then Andrew Johnson, who was not the uh, most popular of presidents, but, you know, here's a guy that one thing he is known for, and William Seward, the Secretary of State, negotiates with Russia and gets uh, all of Alaska in uh, one fell swoop. A huge acquisition for us. And at a time when America was not robust and strong globally, militarily, or even diplomatically, but they were able to, to make those negotiations which had extreme impact on the future of our country. I have to add one other element of a successful negotiation which will be surprising, secrecy. Mm. The reason why Kissinger was able to do his opening to China is it was done totally in secret. He went to Pakistan, he took, can you imagine this, the Secretary of State took a private Pakistani plane mm -hmm. to go see Zhou Enlai. Camp David succeeded because Carter barred the press throughout the entire period. He knew if the press was involved, each would be playing to his mm -hmm. home audience. There would be leaks and pressure from home. By isolating them for 13 days, and keeping the press out, that also was a crucial ingredient. Let's talk about the press, okay? The White House relationship with the media, um, you know, how it's evolved over time and how important it is, both for the presidency uh, and for American public. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you and I were talking a little bit about how, how we get our news different today than we used to. Right. Well, if you've not seen or read Chernow's uh, talk at the White House Correspondents Association on Saturday night, it's worth taking a look at that because he sort of walks through the history of the press and the presidency, the roles, responsibilities, and privileges of both, of bo on both counts. But, you know, it wasn't so long ago during the Reagan administration in the 1980s, there were t basically two news cycles. You had the morning newspaper and you had the evening network news. And staff and the president had time to think about things, respond to things, be thoughtful. And now everything is in an immediate. You have to respond right now. And the press wants to know that the press is tweeting members of your staff. And your staff is responding uh, as an anonymous source or as a quoted source. Uh, and it's, everything is quick, fast, and immediate. And you don't have this time to season and to think and to approach things. Uh, one of the, the great quotes that, I, uh, that President Carter used um, in something he did for us is even during the Iranian hostage crisis, he used the White House as a place to, to think and pray and to reason and to study the issues. And today, if that were taking place, it would have to be a constant action and reaction and volley with the press. So it's, it's times have changed really in just the 30 or 40 years since the Reagan and Carter years. And we expect an immediate response from the White House. And we, the press is not only an entity that tells you what's going on, but they tell you what you should think about what's going on. And so the White House has to deal with that as well. I think it's really, really difficult, and I don't think it does a service 
uh, to the to the uh, people of the country, and probably not to the history, because it will be years before the truth is really known and things are really sorted out by historians. So I think Stuart's point is important. If I may take a, a slightly different tack, but in no way contradictory, the press is protected by the First Amendment. Their job is not just to report on the, what the president does, but to probe, to investigate, mm -hmm. to push, to hold all of us in federal office accountable. And that is an absolutely crucial ingredient that distinguishes democracies from autocracies. Carter was subject of brutal press, brutal press, but he recognized that it had a crucial role in our democracy. He would never call it the enemy of the people. It's not the enemy of the people. It is the thing that makes democracy accountable. Now, how has it changed? Stuart gave some excellent examples, but let me, if I may, add a few more. The first is the press has become highly partisan. In our days in the White House, when, and when I was growing up, there were the David Brinkleys and Walter Cronkites on three networks giving what people assumed was objective news. Today, we watch the news that essentially reinforces our own ideology. Mm -hmm. I can tell you what your political leanings are if I ask you, do you watch MSNBC or do you watch Fox News? That's new and not healthy because it creates a polarization in society. It erodes the vital center, which is essential for compromise. Another difference is social media. So Pope endorses Trump. There's no vetting in social media. People can put on whatever they want, and it takes on a life of its own. Uh, and this is, this is, again, a very dangerous situation. You don't have the editorial checks that you do in the traditional press. And then Stewart's point is very important, the need for instant responses. I mean, the issues that a president has to deal with are exceedingly tough and difficult. And when you have to make immediate responses, it really becomes a burden on a president beyond those that he normally has to deal with. Well, I think also the cable stations being advocates for certain points of view when they share the news takes us back to an early time in our nation's history where newspapers were real advocates for certain points right. of view and would advocate and be the news organ for a certain president. So what old is new again in, in terms of the news? And you referenced that sweet spot that uh, we would have grown up in where you could, you felt like you could trust or believe the network yeah. nightly news. Cast. And you know, this is, this is such an important topic because uh, some of the press has become a virtual instrument of advocacy for the White House. And our democracy, again, depends on compromise and bipartisanship. Now, Stewart's a better historian than I, for sure. But if you look back at the beginning of our republic, we've always had partisanship. You know, Jefferson versus Hamilton, Hamilton versus Adams. Adams says if Jefferson's elected, it'll bring in murder and rape and incest and so forth. But more recently, LBJ, who I served, he got the Civil Rights Bill of 64 because he called Everett Dirksen the Republican minority leader and got him to sign on. Nixon got Democratic support for a lot of his environmental work. All, many of our major successes, like Panama Canal, Howard Baker, the Republican leader, can you imagine that happening today, supported the Panama Canal Treaty, which was unbelievably unpopular. And he knew he'd never been the, be the Republican nominee again mm -hmm. if he did it. But he did it because he thought it was right. Our energy bill, so much of what we did was bipartisan. Uh, and even with Clinton, Clinton negotiated welfare reform with Newt Gingrich, the conservative House member. That doesn't happen anymore, not at all. Compromise and bipartisanship have become dirty words. Mm -hmm. But they are central to our democracy, and I really am concerned when I travel and I see what China does, what others do with autocracies making immediate decisions that we go into this dysfunction because no one is willing to cross the partisan lines as they did quite recently to make major decisions together. And we really are at risk 
I would say Richard and Stewart, at uh, losing our influence if we keep this hyper-partisanship up, if we lose the vital center of American politics. Well, I think at some point we went from negotiations or debate on policy, we went from I'm right and you're wrong to I'm good and you're bad or I'm good and you're evil. And that changed the posture of working together. And you know, as recently as the example of Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill, two ideologically different human beings, but were able to be civil with one another. And, and Reagan the got the big tax reform That's done right. with Democrats. That's right. That's right. So the question is, uh, where do we go with that? What is the role of the media in trying to solve that? What is the role of the president? This is. This has been going on for a number of administrations now, okay? It didn't start two years ago, mm -hmm. uh, this problem. You know, where do you see, who's going to be the adult in the room? Do you see anyone on the horizon that could basically do that? Well, I mean, I see, look, I, I, we won't be partisan. I mean, I, I'm supporting Joe Biden, but that's not the point. We need to have... But you made it anyway. <laughs> so, okay. we, we need to have someone who wins the presidency and says... And I think that there is a yearning for this. We are going to have our differences, but let's respect our differences. Let's find things that we can agree on. Let's restore that moderate middle. I think that's a message that will resonate more than I want to spend, you know, Medicare for all or a green, uh, you know, New Deal and so forth. I really think that's a resonant issue. It has to start at the top with the president. It really has to start with the top. But you and I as citizens also have a responsibility. Right. You know, we find even in social circles, people don't even go to parties with people from the opposite party. You don't want to talk about it. So we've got to say this hyper-partisanship is unhealthy for our democracy. And we have a role, the press has a role, but the president himself has a role. And we can't refer to the opposition as the enemy. They're not the enemy. They're the loyal opposition. Well, I would also hope that there would be, um, and this is going to sound impossible, an educated electorate out there. Information being forced out through the media is, information is not education and understanding issues. And we have a historical illiteracy in our country. We had a we have a Gilbert Stewart painting uh, replica where we, in a place that we do weddings, and you can rent out for weddings. And a bride came in recently, and she looked up at this replica of the Gilbert Stewart painting of George Washington. This is a young bride, an adult, and she said, who is that? And the wedding planner said, well, that's George Washington. He's the father of our country. And she looked at it, and she said, this is a true story, she said, well, I've heard of him, but I don't think I've ever seen a picture of him. And you think, well, do you not have a dollar or a quarter? or <laughs> what, what, what rock do you live under? Yeah. But she doesn't process who this person is. And not only that, why it's important to know who he is. And this is, you know, college-educated young people. History is not being taught. It's not being appreciated. It's not being understood. And it's not being applied to things like candidates and elections. And they're candidates that don't understand history. And that's a really difficult place for our country. Well, I, um, I interviewed uh, one of the Democratic candidates at this, uh, at this conference last year and asked him the same question about partisanship mm -hmm. and what is he going to do about it. And he, he said the same thing yeah. you did. He basically said, what are you going to do about it? Mm -hmm. But, you know, the Milken Institute and Michael Milken have stood for education. It's been central. We have a responsibility for our teachers from grammar school and high school to teach civics. Mm -hmm to teach people what our democracy is all about, to build in a respect for difference, for understanding history. That's really crucial. And, mm -hmm. you know, we can't just say, okay, the president has to do it. Right. Teachers have to do it throughout the country. And again, I think one of the things that, that the Milken Institute stands for is education, but I'm talking about now civics education. So I totally agree with that. Let me ask one more question, and then I'm going to open it up for any questions that... Uh, that you may have, so you may want to think about that. And that is basically what has Watergate, Whitewater, Mueller investigation, what have those things done to the respect for the office of the presidency? Not necessarily the person under investigation, but the office of the presidency. Has it been a positive, a negative? What's your opinion? 
Well, I don't think that's new. I mean, you go back to Teapot Dome, you go back to the Whiskey Ring under Grant. These scandals, these investigations are not new, starting with uh, Watergate or with Whitewater or with uh, Mueller or Iran-Contra. These go back throughout our whole history. And I guess, you know, if it doesn't kill us, it makes us stronger as a nation and as a democracy. But I think we need to, again, study what went before and the lessons that were learned from that, and leaders don't do that. You, we, we have a joke that every new presidency comes in and the new administration thinks history begins with them, that they're the first ones to go down this path and they're going to do it like they want to do it. And they fail to learn from the people and the leaders who have been sitting in those offices and wrestling with these issues before them and they, make, they take shortcuts, they look the other way, uh, but corruption is not new in government. After all, these are human beings. And it's, um, you know, we've had recent examples that have been uh, in our face more through the media. But there are strong examples of history that corruption in government, American government, is not new. So, so Richard, we, we're facing this issue today, 2019. So let's go back. The role of Congress is to investigate. The question is how you do it without being destructive. We created in the Carter administration, as part of the post-Watergate era, the Office of Special Counsel. That's really where Mueller comes from. The first special counsel under Carter that he had created by legislation investigated his chief of staff, Ham Jordan, on the charge, phony charge, by Roy Cohn, who was uh, Joe McCarthy's political hack and represented Studio 54 owners who were plea bargaining that Ham had snorted cocaine in Studio 54. Now, that's not the point. The point is that that investigation of his own chief of staff in a re-election year in 80, never once did Carter say, it's a political job, it's a witch hunt, we let the rule of law go forward. Now, only two presidents in the United States history have been impeached, none convicted by the Senate, Andrew Johnson, and Bill Clinton. Nixon resigned before that could happen. Now we're facing the same issue. I would say to, to my party, look at what happened when the Republicans impeached Bill Clinton. His popularity went to 73 percent. The Republicans lost seats in the midterm elections the first time ever that had happened when the opposition party was in the White House. It would be disastrous. Investigations, yes. Probing, yes. Uh, asking for the Mueller report, yes. But when you step across the line and actually try to impeach, that is a very, very dangerous act. It can really hurt the presidency unless you have an extraordinary sh uh, you know, uh, situation like Nixon where you had a, a tape that implicates him. So the investigative role is important. But again, a hyper-investigation can be very destructive of the party that launches it and against the office of the president. Well, I think that surveys have shown that the American public today would rather see their Congress solve problems than investigate the investigator who investigated the investigation. Yeah, I mean, it's almost 60% There's just a poll that w was out two days ago showing about 60% of the public is against impeaching Trump. Yeah, so. Can I just mention one thing that we were sure. talking about earlier that I think really is important to the modern presidency and that is unique to our country and that is this extraordinary system of presidential library resources that we have and really Jimmy Carter started this model, well uh, Franklin Roosevelt started the presidential libraries but Jimmy Carter the whole post-presidency activism continuing your agenda and here President Carter's been out of office for how many years and still continuing to have an impact which adds to his legacy and role as President of the United States. And he set the model that Clinton followed, that George W. Bush is following now, uh, that Barack Obama is, is preparing to follow. And I think that's an amazing and wonderful thing in our country. And if you've not visited these presidential libraries, I'd really encourage you to do so. They're these extraordinary outposts of civics education and really teach us about the times of these modern presidents, which are continuing to be defined. I think it's just very important. That um, let me open it up to see if any of you have any questions. This gentleman right here, and then that gentleman right there. Thank you. Sir. 
Thank you. Both of you talked about education, the civics classes that we need to refresh ourselves on, and the need for democracy to have an education so you can make informed decisions. Which president in modern era has championed education with those two principles underlying their considerations? Well, I think two, two recent presidents have championed education in general, but not necessarily with that thrust. Uh, Lyndon Johnson really helped create things like the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, uh, worked with Senator Pell to create the Pell Grants. We doubled funding for Pell Grants, Elementary and Secondary Education, Head Start, and so forth. Uh, but I don't think the emphasis on civic education has gotten hardly any presidential attention or education uh, leaders around the country. I mean, you know, we, we get into all sorts of ideological disputes uh, on education, even whether we should have a department, which Carter created. But what I'm talking about is really <laughs> civics education that we teach our kids what our democracy is about, that there are three branches and what the president's role is and what the role of the press is and what the role of respect is for difference. We cannot operate in our democracy if we don't respect our differences and come together on issues that we can do. And we've got so many examples that we've just mentioned. Republicans, Reagan and Nixon and Carter and Clinton and Johnson, who did reach out and where there was a bipartisanship. It's the, the situation in Congress is poisonous. It's poisonous. I mean, we, our Supreme Court nominees become part of an ideological bloodbath. Uh, we didn't have that, I mean, with previous nominees. And we even had a situation where eight months went by with a vacancy, the Supreme Court, and the, ma ma you know, the majority leader of the Senate said, let's wait till the next election. So I think this is tr tremendously important. And I would say to you, basically, I stand to be corrected by Stuart as a great historian, I don't think any president has stressed the civic education part in the way it should be stressed. Well, I'm going to take a, be a little self-serving here and highlight the role of a first lady, and that was uh, Jackie Kennedy became first lady at 32 years old. And one of the two founding principles of our organization is to educate, to teach and tell the stories of the White House and its history going back to 1792 when George Washington selected that little piece of land the White House is on today. And to think about the White House as a stage and a platform through so much of White House history has gone through in this prism, even innovation and technology, Thomas Edison, Alexander Graham Bell, but the decisions that have made in, been made in that building. But to, to the point of what president has impacted education and used that as a, a bully pulpit, I think it's, it's, it's hard to jump to the presidency without considering the curriculum and the standards that have to be developed at the state and local level. And we face that in our education materials that we try to disseminate that we think are wonderful. And a lot of them you can get on our website, whitehousehistory.org. But we've chosen to partner with organizations like Boys and Girls Clubs of America to deploy our curriculum to the local clubs, the local students, because it's too hard. It's too challenging to go through the school districts they're not interested in it. The teachers aren't interested in it. Now, an exception to that is we and a lot of other organizations in Washington are doing teacher institutes and bringing teachers on their own time to teach them how to use this historical resources. But in terms of a president making that a priority for civics education or for pure history education, I just don't, haven't seen that happen. I mean, almost every other democracy has a federal education curriculum. Our education system is unbelievably you know, basically federalized. We have state superintendents, we have city superintendents, we have county superintendents. So it's very hard to have any kind of a uniform curriculum to get something like civic education in the system. It can be encouraged by a secretary of education or by the president, but ultimately it depends on what that local school district is. And one of the things that Stewart and his organization do a great job of is trying to get that done, but it's county by county, city by city state by state. Uh, I mean, I, I've spent a lot of my life on Holocaust uh, justice work. In January of 2000, when I was uh, Under Secretary of State, we, 
created the International Holocaust Education Task Force with the Prime Minister of Sweden. We had six countries. There are now 31 with mandatory uh, Holocaust education. In this United States of America, only eight of the 50 states have adopted. We were the initiators of the whole process. Only eight states have any form of Holocaust education. And it's just an example of how difficult it is to get things in this decentralized system. Well, back to the presidential libraries and local communities, there are 200 presidential sites from coast to coast, birthplaces, childhood homes, presidential libraries, and each of them try to have some educational influence through the, 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 the guy that they represent. And I think that's really important. We convene those 200 every two years to try to build collaboration and educational programming. And so in some way, we're doing it as best we can. But I think to look to a president to champion that I don't know that you'll see that. Well, also, look, education is an area, as Stu alluded to, that at the Milken Institute and the Milken Family Foundation, we have spent our entire lifetime studying and working. We could have all the curriculum in the world. If we don't have teachers to teach it and we don't have students that are willing to learn it, that's another problem. And I would suggest to you that here that are interested, there actually was a session, I believe it was in this room, uh, yesterday afternoon, uh, Lowell Milken moderated a panel that it will be online and you should go on and look at it. It talks about some of the issues in education in general in this country, solutions that we all know work, that are out there. Uh, you talked about early childhood education. There was a member of this panel who talked about the fact that the most important part of early childhood education and other countries are doing multiples of what we're doing in this country in that area is not so kids will learn to read or write earlier but they will be socialized earlier as to why education is important. Mm -hmm. They'll understand what going to school means and how it benefits them. And it makes a huge difference in their ability to learn and their willingness to learn. But you can go on and you know, look at that session from yesterday. Um, I think we had another comment or question over here. Thank you. Not comment, question. question. <laughs> We're not looking for comment. <laughs> Stu, I've got a question for you about something you said about the role of press holding uh, politicians accountable. And, and coincidentally, I, I received a request for a donation from the New York Times last month for, uh, for continuing their mission to hold the president accountable. And I didn't donate because I disagreed with that principle. And, we l and the reason is this. We live in a representative democracy, and the citizens hold the politicians accountable. And I think the press has a vital role in not holding anybody accountable, but just relaying the facts and just the facts and not politicizing anything or editorializing anything. And I think as soon as people believe that the role is to hold politicians accountable and not inform the citizens in the country, it allows them to then provide narratives and pick and choose the facts that they provide to people. And that's when you get the bifurcation of the news networks. And so can you, can you defend your opinion? Sure, because I will I, defend I, it because I think we're not far apart at all. To me, the explanation of facts is what makes politicians accountable. I mean, I've served in the White House twice and in other administrate in other positions, senior positions. And I've been, you know, the subject of uh, press focus. It's very important when I say accountability for the public to know what it is we're doing behind the scenes. It's not just that we announce a policy. How did that policy get formed? Who put pressure on the president to make that decision? And by explaining the facts, that by definition lets citizens hold their people accountable. Now, editorial pages are for advocacy. But the news, and I, here I would say the Wall Street Journal does a good, you know, on the conservative side, the Times, the Post, and so forth, it's the investigative part that is terribly important so we as citizens can make informed judgments about what our elected officials are doing. That's not advocacy. That's what journalism is about. So, okay. um, it's interesting. I'll leave you with this, this thought, well, two thoughts. Uh, one is with respect to advocacy in the press, Walter Cronkite, who was one of those people that when I grew up, you listened to to find out what happened during the day. Uh, once commented the fact that when he came up in journalism, he thought the job of the media was to inform the people of what they needed to know. Mm. Uh, and he said within any 24-hour news cycle on the 6 o'clock news, maybe they can cover 5 to 6% of what went on in the world. 
So they really had to choose that because they really had to tell. They had to make a decision what they thought people needed to know. His criticism of the press today was they now tell people what they want to know. It's become an entertainment medium. So I think it's one thing we all have to be conscious with. And, you know, I've, I, I, I always took the advice that spend time with the media of the side that you do not agree with. Mm -hmm. Go to the philosophies you don't agree with. You're going to learn a lot more about what's happening in the world, listening to a variety of places and reading from a variety of places. And I'll leave you with the last thought because it really stuck with me. Um, when Jeb Bush was one of the candidates for the uh, presidency a couple years ago, uh, I was in an event and somebody asked him, um, did he have anything positive to say about President Obama? Because he was being very critical of a lot of things that he did. And he said, yes, I have a couple things positive. Number one, I think he has a tremendous gift for delivering a message. He says, I wish I had that gift. And then he said something I thought was so fascinating. And I respect anybody who gets elected to be president of the United States. It's not that easy. And if the people elect somebody, I respect that fact. I may not agree with the person, but, you know, so that's one of the things we're losing. So anyway, again, thank you. I hope you found this as interesting as I did. I thank our panelists, Stu, Stewart, for sharing some of your insights with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it.